welcome back to another episode of Stories Behind the Science for BioCT. My name is Peter Propp, and today we're here with Dr. Jeffrey Hines from uh, UConn Health. So, uh, Dr. Hines, please introduce yourself and tell us your title and responsibilities. Thank you, Peter, for this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Hines. Um, by training, I'm a gynecologic oncologist. Um, I take care of women who have ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, cervical cancer. But in my current role at UConn Health, I am the inaugural chief diversity officer. Um, and that's 100% of my, my job. So I, I still have a role in teaching medical students and residents, but I'm no longer practicing gynecologic oncology, still do some research in gynecologic oncology. But this role as the inaugural chief diversity officer um, is a is a full time role, and I'm very excited that it's a full time role. Excellent. So, um, be great to know about your path from high school to college to your your career in medicine. What experiences or conversations helped to define your path? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you, Peter. Um, you know, I'm the product of a public uh, high school across the sound from here. I grew up in Long Island, um, and um, was uh, accepted to an accelerated undergrad medical program at Brown University. It was a seven-year combined undergrad medical program um, and had the privilege of attending Brown for seven years, um, completed my medical degree, um, was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to pay for medical school by the United States Army and did my residency in the Army in, in Colorado in obstetrics and gynecology. Um, after that, um, my family and I, we moved to Fort Hood, Texas, and it was in 1990, right when I was hearing some rumblings about something going on in Southwest Asia and a person by the name of Saddam Hussein and didn't quite understand what that was until I got to Fort Hood, Texas. And literally four weeks after that, I was deployed uh, with the 1st Cavalry Division as a general medical officer to uh, Iraq and Kuwait for seven months. Wow. Um, after that, I uh, finished my time at, at Fort Hood as a general OBGYN physician, and then uh, completed a three-year fellowship in gynecologic oncology at Georgetown University Medical Center, um, and then completed my last five years in the Army as a gynecologic oncologist in San Antonio before relocating to the Atlanta, Georgia area beginning in 2000 as a gynecologic oncologist in a couple of different roles um, for about 10 years in private practice and then 10 years, 12 years actually in an academic medical center in, in the Atlanta area. Um, and then very happily um, when this role came my way, um, was very excited to, to, to take this role. My, my last five years in Atlanta, I split some of my time practicing gynecologic oncology and also doing diversity, equity, inclusion, and health equity. Um, so it was a nice transition for me over these past five to seven years or so to be able to do this type of work full time. So that's a, a little bit about what got me to, to where I am. That's that's quite a story. I, I, I'm just curious about when, when you were deployed, that was around the time when there were more and more women in the army, right? So in the armed forces. Yeah. So it must be interesting. So you were there as a general physician, but you were also seeing women with their gynecological issues as well. That must have been sort of fascinating and, and breaking new ground, I assume. You know, it's interesting you bring that up um, because you're exactly right. You know, when you deploy 500,000 women and men to, you know, a, a war zone, a good number of them are going to be women. And it was the first large experience for the military in deploying that many women. And so a couple of us, while we were in theater, uh, we took the opportunity to do some research on the healthcare needs of women who are in a deployed setting. And we published a couple of papers um, coming out of that experience in the seven months that I was there. And, and hopefully that research helped to shape how we take care of women who are in deployed settings now. So yeah, we took advantage of that opportunity. Yeah, it's still, I know it's still an area that's, that's evolving. Um, as, it as certainly you know. is. Um, so how did you originally become interested in medicine when you were in high school, when you were in middle school? What was the what was the spark? Um, so where I grew up in Long Island, um, uh, we had a volunteer ambulance service. 
and there was one EMT during the day and they needed two people to do runs. So they trained high school students in advanced first aid and in basic life support. And we would, you know, carry little pagers. And if there was a run during the day, we would get called out of high school to do a run. And that was fascinating to me. And and and, and then the other thing that really got me interested as a high schooler um, was being able to shadow um, a Black family medicine physician in my town. Um, that really cemented into me, not only did I want to be a physician, but it was so important for me to see someone who looked like me who was doing this. Um, and um, that was just life-changing for me. It really was. Sure. Um, and um, you've, you've had quite a few career stops and, and, and certainly the military is an institution that has, has many um, uh, traditions, m many um, built-in uh, uh, structures. So I, I, I'm just curious if along the way, did you ever feel like you were in the wrong position or that things were not moving quickly enough or that you weren't getting the opportunities you, you might have? How, how did you discover those issues? How did you get through those issues? Yeah, I, I think um, I was the type of person who um, sought out people that could help me advance career when I needed to and wanted to, and to make the most of those circumstances. For instance, you know, being deployed, realizing, hey, let's take advantage of the fact of let's publish in a scholarly fashion. How do we take care of women who are in a deployed setting? Um, um, things were running a little slow for me career-wise as I was beginning this transition to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and finding someone to really help move my career more in that direction really helps. So I think finding those people at the right times is really how I've been able to, to really pivot when I needed to, to, to pivot. Um, so right. that and that was helpful to me. Right. And now that's really your day job is to help people um, as they discover challenging situations. I, I, I hope so. And, yeah. you know, and that's a wonderful point, Peter, to bring up, you know, being back in this academic environment with all these young minds, um, you know, I, I love it when someone just knocks on the door and it's like, hey, oh, you're Dr. Hines. Um, can I talk to you about, you know, X, Y, or Z? Oh, are you still practicing gynecologic oncology? I have this research issue. Can you work with me? Um so that aspect is 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 still so important to have that open door and to be able to to really give back um, and and serve hopefully not only as a mentor but as a sponsor to to young people. That's great. So um, we've talked about a few of these already, but but what would you describe as any other personal highlights from your career that you could talk about? I'm sure there's been a few. Oh, uh, personal highlights: um, being married for 36 years. The father of two children and now the grandfather of four little boys. Um, so, you know, that is truly my, my personal highlight and being able um, with my wife over the years to, to work hard as a couple, she's a physician as well too, oh, yeah. to, to work hard, to find the balance between family life and professional life. And, and it, it was work and it, continues to be work, but um, it was important for us to be, you know, a couple, to be parents, to be successful professionally, and and now to, you know, our, our three oldest grandsons who are five, three, and three think of the two of us as their best friends, and I, I couldn't be happier to to make impact in their life, but also bringing impact professionally to this work that I'm doing now. I I feel strongly that um, I was very fortunate and blessed to, to bring impact to the lives of women and their families who suffered from gynecologic malignancies through clinical care and through research. And now in this space of diversity, equity, and inclusion to bring impact to the next generation of learners, to a workforce, to a community is just critically important to me. Uh, I'm wondering if I could uh, ask you to talk about, you know, the, 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 the balance you're seeing today 
in the med school population, um, whether it's from a race point of view, a, a gender point of view, it, where where are we today? Where where what where are the goalposts uh, going yeah. forward? <laughs> Thank you, Peter, and it's a wonderful backdrop given conversations that happened at the Supreme Court yesterday, or at least arguments that they heard. So in my role at UConn Health, I not only help to oversee diversity, equity, and inclusion issues for the medical school, but the dental school, the hospital, and the graduate program in, in medicine. And, you know, if you just look at the medical school and the dental school from a, a gender perspective, and this is part of national trends, you know, 60% of the incoming class in both the medical school and the dental school are women. And that's a national trend. Um, uh, certainly from a racial and ethnic diversity perspective or what schools call now underrepresented in medicine, um, you know, the medical school and the dental school are doing fairly well here at UConn Health. About a quarter of the class identifies in that particular group. But I think the big issue is to get beyond representation, to get beyond compositional diversity. You know, compositional diversity is necessary, but it's not sufficient. And it's important not just to members of those particular groups, but it's important to all learners that are here at UConn Health. They all benefit. And the senior leadership team, I benefit from that diversity. The patients that we care for, the rest of the workforce benefits from that diversity. So it's not defined singularly. It's defined by the entirety of the community that benefits from the diversity. And I think that's clearly where those of us that are in this practice um, and have an interest and a passion for this work are really moving toward is is the benefit that we all gain, the bonus that we all gain from richly diverse learning environments. Yeah, I, I was gonna mention that, that, that the, the more you know about a broad set of people, the more you understand their culture, their um, traditions. Um, it's Diwali right now, right? So there's, there, you know, there, there might be a, a, something going on with one family or another that, that you should know about. And if you don't, you never heard of Diwali, well, boy, you, you know, you're missing out, right? So. A a absolutely. And, you know, you're, 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 you're so right. You know, people talk about that, that cognitive piece of diversity, you know, and those teams that you bring together are diverse, you know, they solve problems better. Um, they're better at critical thinking. They analyze data just through that different mindset and deliver outcomes that are are much better. And, you know, there are benefits to society, benefits <clears throat> to government, government better benefits to, to learning that we all gain from that, you know, that cognitive diversity that diverse inclusive teams bring to, to any organization. Yeah. So fi final question, and this sure. is wonderful. I really <clears throat> enjoyed it. I know a lot of people will get a lot out of this, but what advice do you have for those who aspire for a career in medicine? Where do they become for, coming from a, a, you know, a diverse background from any background? What, you know, what, how, how do you, what, what advice do you give young people? Cause I'm sure you talk to a lot of them. Sure. Um, <clears throat> find people early in your career that can provide guidance and advice to you throughout your career. And I think that's what's so critical um, especially as you get ready to decide what you might want to do, to, to have an opportunity to see a lot um, and to also realize that it's a huge responsibility. Um, and I, I, what, what's exciting in this younger generation of learners is they acknowledge the, the responsibility that they have to the greater good. And, and that's clearly what gives me hope. And, and the other thing is, the, the 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 group of people that also want to look at medicine through a different lens. There are those people that want a clinical piece of medicine, and then there are those people who want to be the next generation of investigators. And I think we need to find robust lanes and on-ramps for all of those learners, because we need all of that to happen to, to push things forward. So that's, that's the advice that I would give people. Oh, fantastic. Dr. Hentz, thanks so much for your time today. I, I, I really appreciate it. I know 
anyone watching this video will appreciate it as well. So I hope you have a great day. Oh, Peter, thank you so much for this time and this opportunity. Have a great day as well. All right, take care.